I've been down these these paths so many times that it's all like some kind of uh, recurrent nightmare having to listen to the same old stuff, you know, oh, the ice caps are melting and all oh, the glaciers are receding and all that stuff. But it's, there are counter arguments to every one of these things. And uh, they just, they don't appreciate just how absurd some of these claims are. It's so strange now that politicians are making the choices of what we do with our climate or our weather. We know about weather. Climate is a whole different, and it, it's so large and so complex that it's even almost impossible for someone to talk about. Somehow we've kind of found ourselves kind of cowed into a situation where there's this kind of expert class of unquestionable people. Mm -hmm. And it becomes very convenient for people who like power to uh, start functioning as the intermediaries telling you what the experts are saying. And after a while, you don't even know who these experts are or what they were actually telling you, what their details were. You, you don't, you just take the word of these people who are, shall we say, institutional representatives. I kind of distilled it into an acronym. FSL uh, stands for fear and self-loathing. So that you have these FSL attacks on you all the time. The climate thing is an FSL attack because you're supposed to feel shame using a dryer to clean your your sock dry your socks you're supposed to be afraid that the apocalypse is coming and i can make a list of apocalypses that are far worse than anything you could imagine with climates good morning dr christopher essex <laughs> good morning <laughs> <laughs> well here we it's go. It's morning somewhere, you know, that's it's for sure. It's morning somewhere, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's noon for me. Where am I? I'm in Vancouver. That's where I am. Vancouver Island. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, that's three hours back. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yes. So it's much later in the day for you. Yes. Okay. So um, I'd like you to introduce yourself, if you would, please, sir. And just yeah. tell people what, what you've been doing and uh, the books you've been writing and things like that. Yeah, I'm I'm um, an old old guy, an old scientist. You know, I've been around for a long, long time, and uh, I'm going to be seventy this year, and kind of retired a couple of years ago. And I've had a full career and lots of adventures. I've discovered a lot of interesting things and so on. But early in my career, um, I started out um, having a background in a lot of more technical kinds of things. Uh, and um, so I got the task of building a climate model. They uh, wanted me to do that. And that was a long, long time ago in the 1970s. Mm. So I built my, my first climate model in the 1970s. Mm. And uh, one of the peculiar aspects of my early training was that I was fairly well versed in a a kind of specialized subject that not a lot of people know a lot about called radiative transfer. And uh, so uh, people kind of hooked onto that and said, well, you know about radiative transfer, so you should build this model. And so I did. And um, so a lot of my early experiences about the climate models and so on started with that. And in the late 70s, uh, following up, about 10 years before, there were a bunch of people doing this as frontline research in the 1960s, late 60s. And so um, I could use some of what they had discovered and, and build on it myself and learn a few things accordingly. Um, and one of the things that um, came up, well, first thing that most people don't understand, well, there's a whole bunch of things that people don't understand about this, that just kind of I see in the press and I've been following this since the 70s, they get it wrong all the time. Is the, the the greenhouse gases that people talk about, the most important greenhouse gas, more important than all of them put together, is, um, is, the, is water, water vapor. And so you can actually build a very uh, excellent, um, uh, excellent atmosphere model with just water vapor, skip the CO2, skip all those other gases and and so i was able to build one and it worked very well with just water 
And if you bring CO2 in, which is, of course, the one that everyone's excited about and so on, um, it makes a very, very small change in the system. It's pretty small, but the only reason why it has any effect at all is because it just happens that the contribution that CO2 makes is at a certain point in the spectrum. And I just want to mention something about light. Uh, as you know, I mean, my shirt's blue and, and your sweater, I guess, is a kind of brownish color, it looks to me, uh, but it's hard to tell in the light. But the colors are come to us because the light is composed of many different frequencies. And, you know, if you, you can switch view things in all these different colors and they all add up to our experience. But if you go to the red and then the far red and get even further red, you can't see the color. You can't see the colors anymore. Eyes fail. But the physics is that there's still light there. And, uh, and it has still its own set of colors, which human beings can't see. That's the infrared. And uh, the infrared is very important because uh, people imagine the reason why the atmosphere is warm is because the sun heats it up. But that's not actually the case. What happens is the sunlight comes all the way down to the surface like this. And then the surface heats up and then it radiates up in the infrared. And that's where the warmth comes from. So it's it's a bottom up rather than a top down. So the sort of best way to think of it, because the the warmth of the atmosphere, there's a spectrum of of brightness that's associated with the warmth of the atmosphere, and then there's the warmth of quotation marks of the from the sun, and the two don't overlap because the temperatures are so very different. So basically, the real physical problem is is uh, the infrared light coming up through the atmosphere and going into space. And that's ultimately what makes it warm in the atmosphere. That's the greenhouse effect, right? So you can get a perfectly good atmosphere if you just consider the water vapor, because the water vapor absorbs very strongly in the infrared. It's uh, the, the nature of the molecule. It's not just three components, but it's kind of slightly bent. So it just, it tends to uh, swing around in many different ways and that allows it to have this very strong and broad, lots of activity across the infrared. Um, and so as it happens, this is a well-defined structure and there's a, an interval where the uh, water vapor contribution is not as strong as called the window, water vapor window. And it's just a small frequency range and it just happens that the certain band of carbon dioxide, CO2, the 15 micron band, lines up with that hole. That's well, get it towards the camera. So there's this hole, you know, mm, there's the hole, and then the 15 micron band. And the reason why I say band is that in molecular spectroscopy, it's not just one line. I should just mention for a minute, like I'm, go I'm going backwards thinking, oh, I should mention this, I should mention that. Um, if you take a little pan spectroscope and you go into a place with fluorescent light tubes and you point it at the fluorescent light tubes, you'll see a beautiful color, range of color, but then you'll see these bright slices through it. And those are spectral lines. And uh, that's, that's the signature or the fingerprint of quantum mechanics coming into our world. I mean, that's what happens. In molecular spectroscopy, you have lines, we have other kinds of absorption as well, but you have lines as well. And they have to do with the rotation of the molecules and the vibrations of the molecules, and it's called the vibration rotation spectrum. So you'll get lines, but you get lots of them, and they kind of sort of overlap with each other. And, and the 15 micron band that I was telling you about, which lines up with that little hole, it's got like about 10,000 of these little, little bands little lines and the whole thing is called a band right so I'll, I'll talk about bands and that that's what it's not because it's like drummers and uh right. and, and guitar players that's that's well, a band be. we don't know that yet <laughs> yes yeah. right so uh uh yeah so uh uh so the only reason why co2 has any effect at all is because of that water vapor window and that's the only reason why we're even talking about it. If that window wasn't there, uh, CO2 would have no effect whatsoever. There's, it has another band uh, that 
you know, when I put in my models, like all those decades ago, uh, around four microns. That's the, so the the that, the number of microns. That's the wavelength of the light that they're talking about. So it's mm -hmm. uh, micrometers, four micrometers, right? Four point three or something like that. But it's it's an interval. So you know where you want to say the middle is is a little bit flexible. But um, then you have other trace gases. There's ozone. Ozone contributes. It's a uh, uh, three oxygen molecules or atoms, I should say, in making a molecule. And uh, and then there's, of course, methane and nitrous oxide and chlorofluorocarbons. And there's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, in my model, it was kind of known at the time that uh, if you put that in, it wouldn't make any difference. And there are a couple, couple three reasons for it. And that one of them is, is that the, all of the intensity or the effectiveness of this stuff is multiplied by the brightness of something called the um, Planck function, and it happens to be a small, small, smaller value where the strongest absorption takes place. And at the same time, the water vapor or water gas, but it's water molecules, are very active, and and so. Uh, they basically completely swamped the effect. So when I would put it into my model or take it out, it wouldn't make any difference. And it didn't. And I did that. And and you know, I take it out, put it in. Nothing happens, right? I mean, or at least nothing really discernible. And why? It's not because the line absorption properties of nitrous oxide isn't strong or it's or methane isn't strong it's because you're doing the complete radiative transfer problem and not just talking about the absorption properties of the molecules and so that's the that's the mistake that people are making they're making a mistake let me say that mistake which is that that you can go on the government of canada website and they'll compare nitrous oxide to to and methane to carbon dioxide in terms of its weight, how many tons, this many tons versus that many tons. But that's only, that's a, like they only have solved part, the first half of the problem, which is to talk about the, the second half of the problem is to run it through the whole atmosphere and do the calculations. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a rule, generally, uh, this, this whole subject of climate change, I mean, I've been in it for so long, I'm such an old grizzled veteran on this, that I just have kind of you know, kind of uh, said, okay, I've had enough. I've been in the company of madness for too long, and I just, I've got to do something useful with my life and not con complete, continue to bang my head against the wall with this this thing. So I've just more or less ignored it and uh, for, for the last while, um, hoping that, you know, if I write books like this, you know, that's enough. People can read it and, and I don't have to say anything. But I've discovered that usually what happens when you write a book like this, then they say, what's in the book? You know, they sort of, <laughs> so, you gotta so, uh, yeah. So, uh, um, uh, so, so I've been kind of playing it cool and I've been doing really great research, realizing the limitations of models. So I have gone into deeper and deeper physics and mathematics and, and uh, the, it's just a world of wonders. And I've just enjoyed my career immensely. I've discovered a whole bunch of, little really important unfashionable things that uh have, is something I've, i'm going to really in my dotage uh look back on and smile about but uh uh this whole climate thing has just been well it took me covid to start to realize what i was really dealing with and uh it, it, it's not dealing with anything rational or reasonable it's just human interactions and you know frankly i'm not really very good at that kind of thing so it's just uh, I'm more interested in the universe and not so much interested in the, you know, the how how to you know outsmart somebody in a Machiavellian way and more that I'm interested. Thank in that. goodness for that. Yeah, well, there well, are lots of. It's hard though. It's hard, you know. Logic, which is where you lie, is is within logic and reason. I would say, um, mathematics, physics, um, that's not politics, and it's so. Strange now that politicians are making the choices of what we do with our climate or our weather, it, which I read about in your book. We know about weather. Climate is a whole different and uh, 
it, it's so large and so complex that it's even almost impossible for someone to talk about or at least to predict. I can I can look and see when I'm on the prairie, I can see whether it's going to rain in five hours. And that seems pretty good and reliable. And other than that, I know that there'll probably be winter, you know, in the winter and summer in the summer. But other than that, asking for more depth of understanding, you're you're just looking for, I don't know, flies in the ointment because, you know, how does it, how does a politician even think about making a judgment on the climate, right? They, what do they well, do? I, I think there's a really important aspect of, about uh, uh, democracy in this. Um, everyone has got to become their own version of an expert mm. in order to make intelligent decisions politically. But somehow we've kind of found ourselves kind of cowed into a situation where there's this kind of expert class of unquestionable people. Mm -hmm. And it becomes very convenient for people who like power to uh, start functioning as the intermediaries telling you what the experts are saying. And after a while, you don't even know who these experts are or what they were actually telling you, what their details were. You, you don't, you just take the word of these people who are, shall we say, institutional representatives. And so we have this kind of uh, uh, divorce from the idea of individual human beings making intelligent decisions and, and making a democratic society and so forth, because everyone is just taking, is basically uh, abrogating their obligation to make decisions by mm -hmm. just deferring to somebody who has been claimed or was claimed to be an expert. And uh, it's really terribly important that in a functioning democracy, people have to learn to think with their own heads, which means they have to go into these things a little bit more deeply than some kind of throwaway story in the newspaper written by a science journalist or something like that. Because uh, what mm -hmm. you should have is you should have, I mean, this climate change stuff I, I i mean i was completely alone on that i mean in the why did you undertake it in the beginning like what what were you thinking why why climate uh well it, it's it's because of the radiative transfer i got involved in this thing and uh people wanted me to do computer modeling and uh I see. and that was okay i was okay with that and i mean because computers are fascinating and there's a whole deep rabbit hole to go down and talk about that from, from artificial intelligence on and optimization and things like that, which after 37 years in an applied mathematics department, I've had a taste of all of these things, right? I mean, it's, you've got my nose in a lot of things, but um, you know, from, from uh, well, I hang around with chemists and theoretical physicists and, and fluid dynamicists and, and people like that. And so you, after a while, you just learn all this stuff by osmosis. So I know a lot of, because mathematics is kind of a backdoor into almost every technical field. It's like, you know, after you've done enough of that, you start to see how they all kind of lay out. You kind of have a feeling for it. And uh, um, I think I do have a feeling for the, for that now. And so mathematics is a very different thing for me than maybe some, some other people, because I, I've, I've just been exposed to so many different things. And I've, I'm very grateful for that opportunity, but it, it makes my position a little bit unusual. But I did start with climate models. And uh, then because I had this expertise with with uh, with radiator transfer at the time, I was in early on the Canadian uh, general circulation model. That's the big, big climate model. And you know, I helped with that. And uh, it, at least certainly with their radiation models and so on a bit, they had ended up having their own experts on that. But uh, uh, and I, I got involved in more exotic kinds of things of a physics nature, radiative entropy transfer, and a bunch of other, you know, really fun things that uh, were fun for me. Anyway, mm -hmm. that were really interesting, but had nothing to do with climate. But basically, I realized that uh, all of these models were 
kind of the, the our best guess, the, the kind of a cartoon of what's really going on. It's not the, it's not the implementation of the exact known classical physics, which is all established and so on. But mm -hmm. I came to realize that in many respects, much of what people dismiss as completed classical physics is not really so well understood. And there's there's just so many ways in which one can go into that. And I've explored a lot of them and and I'm still working on that even at at, at this point. Um, I, but, if I could ask you to go through some of the uh, terms that you outlined because uh, people beca because people have kind of a cartoon idea of of physics and math and they don't understand, the intricacies of climate, you outlined some terms that I've looked up and, and now I understand better. But, you know, I wouldn't claim to uh, know very much. I just understand it better. So you talked about turbulence. Yes. Uh, Kolmogorov. 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 Turbulence. Yeah, it's a Ru Russian a Russian uh, physicist, right? Who is this famous for his work on turbulence, and so he got uh, uh, a whole a whole sort of idea of how how it worked. Uh, the, the the problem is that most of all of us deal with fluids, and most of the time we dismiss it. It's not really very important. You know, the water comes from the tap, and uh, uh, the water runs down the river and the rain falls from the sky and, wow, well, it's just wet, you know, and whatever. But if you actually start to follow the flows, you start to realize that it develops these kind of funny behaviors where it starts instead of just going down like a, like a good good water droplet, it sort of backs up and go, turns around and spins around. And these are called vortices. Mm -hmm. And so you end up with, with the, the turning kind of motion, which can be, well, it could be stretched out quite a bit, but it, it, I'm just trying to, you know, simplify it by saying you have a turning motion, it's like you have a wheel, and then it, within that wheel, you have another wheel, and then another wheel, and so forth. And so most of air movement, for example, is is turbulent at some to some degree. And mm -hmm. so it's always kind of, it's like a water in a, in a, a teapot, I mean, or you're, bo you're boiling the water, and you're in a pot, you know, you just see the the, the, the roiling water and so forth. That's turbulence. And uh, turbulent flow is one of the uh, uh, great unsolved problems in science that's still in the classical domain. And there's all kinds of, you know, interesting insights connected with modern mathematics and so on that, that actually connect with that. And there's some people who have spent their whole lives just studying that. I And I've had the privilege of knowing some of them who were in my department, and so it was turbulence experts, and many fascinating things to say about that. So, uh, but the the fact is that you get in a three dimensional situation, you have big wheels, and then you have little wheels, and then wheels within wheels, and eventually, the internal friction becomes enough that that you don't get any more wheels. And uh, in air, that's the bottom size scale that you get it is about about a millimeter, that's called the Kolmogorov microscale. And anything below that, you won't get any more wheels within wheels. So, you know, that's like, you know, this big, right? I, so um, any kind of climate model or any kind of computation that you're doing, you always have, you have this basic problem with all computers, which, the, pro the problem with me even speaking about this stuff is that, that I'm always sort of pushing against some kind of popular understanding of it. And the problem is computers are treated like some kind of a, a demigods mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and uh, that people should have, they should worship them rather than use them as tools. Right. So uh, I was a uh, uh, Phi, Phi Beta Kappa visiting scholar in the States. And one of the talks I, I gave was uh, called on being smarter than a screwdriver. And the idea was that the first rule when you're using a screwdriver is to be smarter than the screwdriver. And uh, it's the same thing with computers. You should be smarter than computers. I know people, how can you do that? Because they're like demigods, right? I have to worship them, you know. But the fact is that all computers have this really, really big problem, even quantum computers, but not as much of a problem, but it's still 
which is there's only a finite number of numbers in a computer. And you might it might sound like a kind of, well, so what? I mean, there must be a lot of numbers in there. But the problem is that you need a lot more numbers in order to uh, really handle the whole universe. And uh, you, you end up with this kind of class. They, they, the, the way in which that's officially said is as if all computers have a finite representation. That's the technical way of saying it. It sounds more sophisticated than saying only a finite number of numbers, right? But that's what it means. So if you are going to um, take your you know, demigod computer and you're going to try to run it forward in terms of, um, of uh, what the future is going to be 100 years from now, you have to take the classical equations that you are pretty sure are very close to being right because you only have a finite number of numbers you can have in there, but the equation, the mathematics is calling for an infinite number of numbers to be <laughs> to put it. Yeah, it, you need all of them, right? That's the idea, but you only have a finite number. So what you have to do is you have to take the equations and take the mathematical equivalent of a chopping knife and you have to chop it up in little pieces, right? And then you kind of hang it on to the numbers you actually have in the computer. And when you actually represent even a, a, a value that you get, you have to, at some point, you have to chop off the end of the numbers because, because you need numbers to represent a number in all its decimal places. So you're always going to have a problem that way. And one of the most entertaining things I would do uh, when I would begin a first year class in calculus when I was uh, teaching um, would be to uh, have the students show what the correct value of a, of a particular ex mathematical expression was, and it would come to the value one. And then I would ask people to take their hand calculators and put in, evaluate this expression at the value of x equals 40 or something like that. And the calculators would all tell them that the answer was zero, right? I mean, so the computer would get it wrong. And that's not there's a perfectly good explanation for it. And you under, if you understand it and you can be smarter than your screwdriver, you're okay. But if you're not, that, that can get you into a lot of trouble. And, uh, and uh, it, it, that's just with evaluating functions. But when you go to differential equations, you get all kinds of other weird things happening. So you have to throw away part of your equations. You have to um, not, not worry about things that are between your grid points. So in other words, uh, um, you, do, you know, you're looking at me and I'm looking at you and the image is actually a bunch of little dots on a screen and they're very close together and there are a lot of them so we don't really see the dots but anything that's between the dots that's on my face or your face we can't see it's lost right and that's and and what happens in all climate models all of them is that you know, there's always going to be some kind of hole that you can fall between. So if that's one pixel, there's another pixel and you zoom in, eventually you lose your whole, my whole face. So in other words, if I'm, if the dots get wider and wider, there's no face to be seen, right? I mean, and that's, this is the idea is all the wiggles that are in the solutions of these mathematical equations have to be bigger than the distance between the dots. Otherwise you lose them. I mean, that's basically what's, what's happening. So, the problem, and so that's what we would teach students if you were using a computer to solve differential equations, which is really the language of nature. Nature speaks to us in such such mathematics. Uh, if you wanted to uh, project into the future and do what we would call proper computation, where you've got all the little wheels taken into account, um, you would at least have to be able to have a grid that's smaller than the Kolmogorov microscale, which is a millimeter. So if you put a, that would mean, <laughs> don't don't think about this, but we would all have to sit very still while the you know it's, it's while you were doing the computation so that hold our breath and so forth because you know the scales of activity are that small. So if you do a proper calculation, you'd also have to ask the god of thunder to stop making lightning strokes and, you know, things like that, which the equations can't cope with. And there's, you know, about 2 million of those a year, but shh, don't mention that. Anyway, so uh, what, so you have this millimeter scale. And if you then, you can estimate using 
t- typical clock rates for computers and so on, how long it would take a proper computation out to about, say, 10 years into the future. And uh, the number comes out very, very easily to be about the age of the universe squared. So, mm. uh, <laughs> so, so the, so you're stuck with this, this reality, and the scale of the problem is enormous. And um, so, in order to fix that, so that we can actually have a a result next week or something, you end up having to not make it a millimeter grid, but make it a much larger grid. And, you know, when I was paying attention to these things, they were down to like uh, about a hundred kilometers. So between the points. Wow. Um, and uh, not one millimeter, but a hundred kilometers. And, you know, you can always make it smaller in exchange for losing accuracy on something else. Right. I mean, that's always a, another possibility. Um, so uh, once you, once you have that, the problem is there's a whole bunch of physics going on below the resolution of this this grid. And if you don't take that into account, the whole thing is just going to be total trash. So you have to create a bunch of what they call subgrid scale physics. So they 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 come up with that and they try let's say nobly to come up with ways to make that seem more or less plausible. But at this point you're not talking about a deterministic calculation of exact representations of the present day into the future. It's it's now a cartoon, right? I mean, it's not it's not a a, a real direct computation of known equations. It's it's a cartoon, and I don't mean that to be particularly pejorative or anything because they I I, I admire people who work on these models and so on for what they are, but as a device for government policy, I think they're really not up to the task in many respects, because they're, they're engineering models are like that too. I mean, if you want to calculate turbulence over the wing of an aircraft or something like that, uh, you, you, you don't get all the wheels within the wheels uh, necessarily. So you, you end up doing some empirical thing that seems to work over the wing of an aircraft. And then to test how good your model is, you put it into a wind tunnel and then you do measurements and say, yeah, that looks like this cartoon was working really precisely. And uh, because they could put the wing in the wind tunnel and trial and error and so on. And so that's a completely legitimate thing to do. But the problem is that there's no wind tunnel for climate. You can't take these empirical things and then take, hey, let's put the whole planet into a wind tunnel and turn it on and see what happens. I mean, it 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 it's, looks like it's empiricism in the sense of an engineering problem, but it's not. It's a form of extrapolation, is what it is. You're actually extrapolating into the future, and um, uh, there's no fix for that because what we're doing dealing with is a really um, it's a form of very extreme computing. I mean, that's that's what's involved, and um, so that's. One of the reasons why I decided I wouldn't get into building models further without really understanding what some of these problems are and why they are what they are. And um, uh, the turbulence problem was kind of like the the entryway into discussing that. But then, you know, we start to encounter all these misunderstandings about uh, about the sort of basics of what's going on. And people have this I, very naive idea about greenhouse effect. And uh, I think that they've turned it into this, well, I call it a runaway metaphor because they have something, it's like something else. It's, and then it becomes something else. And this is the exasperating thing for me. I mean, you know, one of the things that would teach me in graduate school uh, when taking graduate level radiative transfer was that um, was that greenhouses don't work by the greenhouse effect. It's kind of a, it was a kind of a joke. We all would laugh about it and that's true. Uh, but um, it, it, it's one of those things that you either know that or it's completely novel. And the difference is really important because um, if 
greenhouses have a certainty <coughs> that um, that uh, uh, greenhouses have a certainty that that the real atmosphere doesn't have, and uh, it's because of the fact that the the compensation in the greenhouse is pretty straightforward. I mean, you just put up some glass, and then the the boiling air kind of bumps into the glass, and that's as far as it can go. Um, but in the atmosphere, the boiling air is driven by not the temperature, but by the differences in temperature. So the, we call that the gradients. So the gradients are what drives things. Gradients in pressure, gradients in temperature. And that's that's what makes things go. Uh, and uh, that then leads into the turbulence problem. So all these complexities that I was telling you about suddenly become really important in the actual atmosphere, and they're not important in a greenhouse. So you have the certainty of the greenhouse grafted onto the real physical problem. And so that's annoying. The uh, fact that they don't understand that water vapor is the most important absorber. And the only reason why the original climate models had any chance of having any effect from CO2 is by saying, okay, well, there is this tiny effect from carbon dioxide, but it causes more water to go into the atmosphere. And then that powerful absorption is what causes the, the changes. So it kind of piggybacks onto the water uh, in in reality. And it's not the CO2 itself that causes this. And and so there's, there's all kinds of people with PhDs and so on who don't know about that. And they just think that CO2 is the cause of everything. And well, it's, it's, it's a, so, um, uh, yeah, well, you see, now you got me ranting. So <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Let's see, what what let's see what other uh, terms I can find here. Um, you talk about uh, the Lorenz equation, the butterfly effect. Yes. Fa fairy tales of computation. You talk about those. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a very interesting thing. One of the things that I did for quite a few years in my career was uh, to teach uh, advanced courses on nonlinear differential equations, uh, sensitivity to initial chaos, that kind of thing. So um, let's see. There was a, a point where there was a fellow who uh, wanted to, Barry Saltzman, yes, of course. So he was at, at Yale and he, he said, okay, well, the heck with this computer modeling stuff. Let's try to solve the problems directly from the the they call the, the the fundamental equations of meteor, but they're really talking about the Navier-Stokes equation, which is a, a very famous equation for the behavior, the motion of fluids. And um, actually, I should just make as a side note: I when I've been um, interviewed uh, at various points, I would always uh, ask a journalist who'd come to talk to me about climate. They would uh, start to to start asking me questions. And I said, well, first, I, before I give you an interview, I'm going to give you a pop quiz. And then, of course, they immediately, yeah, said, can you tell me what you know about the Navier-Stokes equations? And of course, <laughs> they'd never even heard of them, you know? I mean, you have somebody who's the the environmental editor of a famous newspaper trying to interview me about about the subject. And, and not, it's not just that he doesn't know what it, he's never even heard of the Navier-Stokes equations, but these are the, it's the fundamental equations governing the motions of fluids, right? I mean, that's, that's it's never heard of them. I mean, it's it's fine if you don't know. I mean, I, I don't expect everyone to know everything all the time, but if this is your subject, I mean, this is your specialty and you've never heard of them, that tells you what you're really dealing with. I mean, but yeah, okay, so uh, what, one of the problems was that everyone knows that climate isn't what you see when you when you look at the weather today or tomorrow. It's some kind of average weather. And and of course, I try to make that look a little bit sketchy <laughs> because it is sketchy. I mean, uh, what what does that mean? I mean, average weather. I mean, it's weather is a class of phenomena. You, you, it's not a, it's not something that is a number that can be average, right? It's just like you know, average electricity. I mean, what what's that? I mean, but that's what they, everyone seems to be. Oh yeah, okay, average weather. I mean, what's <laughs> it just seems funny to me. Anyway, so uh, yeah, well, okay, fine. So they average the weather. They they know that there's some kind of average. So maybe you could take the differential equation Navier-Stokes, which is 
super famous. I mean, if uh, there's a list of, I think it's eight unsolved, fundamental unsolved problems in mathematics. And uh, among them, one of them is about the Navier Stokes equations, just proving the solutions exist. I mean, never mind what they are, but the proving they exist. And of course, we numerically solve it all the time but every night for the weather forecast. But it's just, you know, it's like there's a million dollar prize for that, right? I mean, it's not, it's not a small thing, you know, it's, to maybe make some extra pocket money if you, on a rainy weekend, go and try to prove that. I mean, that's <laughs> the clay millennium problems. There, there, there's something. Whether, yeah. So anyway, so the idea, actually, back in the 19th century, there was this guy um, uh, who decided that he wanted to you know, get this this out of the navier Stokes equation, and he thought, well, I'll just average these whole equations over time. And the, the problem that they encountered was that if you do mathematics on it to average the equations, and you can do that in a number of different ways, but one of the ways is to do, for people who know about this, you can integrate over time. And um, well, that's fine. Everything seems to check out, except that you end up with this extra term where they have an integral on, and you have a product, integral of a product. And so that becomes a completely new object. It's not something that you can just take apart and put it in terms of the averages of the original value. So you get this extra variable that comes in. And so you, instead of simplifying things, everything's got more difficult. And you can't, you can't take, let the average equations work on their own, because you have to always refer to the unaveraged equations to figure out what the value of this new variable is, right? I mean, that's that. So so that's that's known as the closure problem of turbulence, and it's a very fundamental one. So anyway, Barry Saltzman tried this. He said, okay, well, let's just try this from a climate point of view, and let's try to average this stuff. And so he spent a lot of his career trying to take these equations apart in different ways. And, um, well, eventually, after enough years, I mean, he was, th th I think that's an extremely challenging thing for him to do. After enough years... Um, he eventually gave up on it. But interestingly enough, um, the uh, some of his work trickled down to this person by the name of Edward Lorenz. And Edward Lorenz uh, uh, simplified them and, and produced a set of simple equations that exhibited behavior that people previously hadn't really digested in nonlinear dynamics. And it kind of caused... A rev it's, he wrote a paper in the 1960s about it, but it kind of caused a revolution which broke out fully around the 1980s or 1990s. And it completely changed how a lot of science was done and how people thought about things. And it had to do with this idea of sensitivity to initial conditions, right? So there's it, just a very small difference between, between how you start out, you end up in a completely different place. Well, not quite completely different because it doesn't go away to infinity. I mean, we already already had equations where a very small difference would lead to one going to infinity, going faster than the other, and so. But they would stay close together, but they would just would hang around in what's known as an attracting set, and and uh, but they would just be on the other side of the attracting set, and eventually they might get close together again, but they never quite travel together exactly, and so they. A return and everything else, and that's this is the phenomenon of chaos, and so you have the sensitivity of things moving apart and so on. Well, that's what people kind of who did weather forecasting understood this instinctively, and um, it's called uh, natural variability uh, in the meteorological world, and uh, so they understood that after a certain number of days the weather, your forecast and the weather can be quite different. Mm -hmm. But one of the big advantages of of um, of weather forecasting over climate is that you can kind of run similar scenarios over and over again. Oh, you know, yeah, then the, the storm tracks up from the south and then goes in this direction and so on. And you can do that and you can say, well, we got it wrong that time. What did we do that cause that to be wrong. And so they can get, get better and better, but there's all kinds of problems, even computationally that, uh, you know, I could get into, but I don't think you want to hear that. But uh, in any event, the uh, revolution was caused by 
by by partly by Lorentz and by some other other means as well on how we think about solutions and of, of in the how we think about the mathematics as applied to the real world and there are all kinds of fascinating things that come out of the behavior of solutions of in mathematics so you can have situations where you have completely uniform behavior and then you can suddenly get a change and there's no external cause at all it's just part of the internal dynamics and the human reaction would be to say what caused that but nothing caused it it's just part of the internal dynamics so that that it does that and i can cite simple examples of that and i do in the, in the book as well it's just to illustrate the concept and you can see one of the sort of classic problems of people being in, empirical is they say well you know tomorrow is going to be like yesterday and and so you you see this kind of constancy of what's going on and then then and you know it's the classic example of something jump someone jumping off a top bill a tall building and then you know it, uh, getting down you know so far it's been pretty good you know after 10 seconds of falling down towards the pavement you know it's a it's empirically it's fine you know I mean, so you you have to be able to think about if you're going to think about climate you have to be thoughtful in that way you have to be aware that there's a lot of stuff we don't know and uh you, you can't get caught up into this whole miasma about uh how the weather looks different and everything else that's just anyway so again i'm ranting you see you just have to say a couple things and i was just I know this is great. I'm yeah. having a good time. Yeah. So you talk about uh, ergodicity. You talked about a nescience, nescience, bewilderment. Nescience. Oh, yeah. That means it's that's, it's not yeah, just something that you're ignorant about. You know absolutely nothing about it. You don't even know that there's an issue. I mean, and that's uh, and and uh, I think this. I kind of spill over. Uh, I have trouble because sometimes the problem with the discussion is not not the sort of fine points at the top it's the the the, the base is all all wonky i mean so the the idea that that we know things i mean it's um what is it that u.s uh secretary of defense who said the unknown unknowns that's that's what we're talking about because there's a a lot of things in the world where we just don't even we're not even aware of what we don't know and uh and instead of talking about, well, we just don't know, people have this funny way of saying it. Well, it's uncertainty, you know, and that's a different kind of not knowing. It's like, yeah, this value is somewhere between here and there. Mm -hmm. I'm uncertain whether it's here or whether it's there. But if you don't even know there's a value to be uncertain about, then you're in a completely different league of ignorance. And, uh, and that's um, a part of the... Uh, aspect of research that people have bad epistemology, uh, shall we say, is that there's this kind of idea that um, there's an expert on everything, and that uh, if I don't know it, then there's somebody over there who does know it, and I just have to consult them and, and take it in. But research is not just about what I don't know. Research is about what nobody knows. I mean, nobody knows, right? So the whole idea of having an expert on what nobody knows is already very problematic. So when you're doing research, you're in this completely great unsolved jungle of unknown unknowns, and you're trying to put the puzzle pieces together. And then when someone calls in and says, <clears throat> can we have an expert on this to decide whether you get grants? or whether your paper gets published and so on. <clears throat> well, it's kind of a, a non sequitur. That's why they call it peer review and not expert review. Mm -hmm. But they take it as if it's expert review, but it, it isn't. And usually what happens is that if, you, if you're doing something that's, well, you do a kind of research that's really interesting and really fun, where you're far out beyond what people really underst normally understand, uh, you're going to have a big uphill battle trying to convince people that this is actually worth even looking at and because uh, they're busy doing their own research and and or it may step on the toes of of uh, some established uh, ways of thinking and and so forth so you're going to be 
having a rugged old time. And I'm kind of in a situation right now where I can just work on whatever I want and, uh, and no matter how much, and I can have as much fun as I want. So it's, uh, it's, it's a really great time of my career right now. So <laughs> it so. must be, it must be tricky though, to look and see what's happening in the world, the opinions of, of the climate uh, um, narrative and what, and then what you're doing, because I doubt if they're, well, I've I've been I've been down these these paths so many times that it's all like some kind of uh, recurrent nightmare having to listen to the same old stuff. You know, oh, the ice caps are melting and all oh, the glaciers are receding and all that stuff. But it's there are counter arguments to every one of these things, and uh, they just they, they don't appreciate just how absurd some of these claims are and, and and you know you know i mean there was a a site that that was recording all the news stories about climate change and you know they had things like uh well the nessie was killed by climate change loch ness monster and yeah you know, oh these street lights are melted it must be climate change there apparently or at least there was a report that there was some er physician in bc who diagnose somebody with climate change so uh that's you know it's you know, redheads were going to go extinct you know that was you know oh, it, wow. it, it just the, the stories are and it, this site was called the number watch i think and they had a link to the news story about every one of these things and, and there were so many of them and uh um at one point i felt it was my duty to go forward and said why this do, would make any sense so someone would have a stick of nonsense and they'd throw it and then I'd go barking after it like a dog, you know, and pick it up and say, oh, this this makes no sense. And then by the time I bring it back, they throw another stick of nonsense. And after a while, <laughs> I, after a while, I just kind of gave up on it. I said, okay, I'm not doing this anymore, right? So, so the end result of that was that I actually had a guy uh, send me an email. It was just about a year ago. And apparently there was some kind of, dialogue on Twitter about whether I was still alive or not. <laughs> so he said, are you, still, are you still alive? And, and then I got to use the Mark Twain, you know, the, the, what is it? The, the rumors of my demise are greatly exaggerated or whatever. I <laughs> said, that's <laughs> so, anyway, um, uh, it's just humans being humans. And, uh, um, I used to think that, you know, we were in a sensible age, but uh, no, we just sort of switched to a different kind of insanity. I mean, the generation before me were, you know, caught up in, in wars and made huge destruction and, and, and terrible, terrible things. And you think, well, now they got that out of their system and now we're going to be sensible. Well, forget that. I mean, and uh, I think it only really came home to me when when we lived through this COVID nonsense, I mean, most of that, uh, I mean, it's not nonsense that people die. I mean, that's, the, you know, the problem is to be able to contextualize these things and separate them out and talk in an intelligent way when people are being deeply, deeply irrational is, is very difficult. I mean, if you start getting technical with people, it's, well, you know, you're not an expert, you know, what do you... I'm sorry, I didn't know about numbers, and I did actually review an article on the COVID-19 genome, but I mean, that's uh, <laughs> that doesn't make me an expert. <laughs> but, but there's so many flaws with that. I mean, oh, gee, you know, your, your mask doesn't work unless I wear mine. I mean, it's like, <laughs> does that make any sense? No, it doesn't yeah. make any sense at all, right? I mean, most of the stuff was nonsensical and and uh and you had this this slavish claim that well you know i'm i'm a politician and i have to do what the science tells me to do and well we have a panel of experts telling us what we should be doing i really have my doubts about those experts you know? i mean so-called so, experts mm -hmm. yeah well yeah yeah mm -hmm. anyway you see you know I, yeah. you, you signed me up to talk and now i'm doing it <laughs> <laughs> So you sent me a paper this morning on uh, nitrous, nitrous oxide. Nitrous, nitrous. Nitrous oxide and climate. Yes. By, There's some stuff about methane. 
Yes, by and you said you knew some of the authors. Yeah, the last two authors I, I know Mrs. fairly Pepper well. And Van uh, Willingarden. Weingarten, yeah. Mm -hmm. Weingarten. Yeah. Hmm, that's a lot easier to say. And mm. so, oh, that was a very interesting paper. So talking about variants of the nitri nitrogen cycle have been yeah. operating through several billion years, and it's always contained some nitrous oxide. Yeah. But there's it's no a natural. It's a natural it's compound. It's constant in time. Yeah, it's a natural compound. Just because yeah. people are, it comes out of fertilizer, doesn't mean that it's not a natural compound. And in fact, as it was explained to me on a few occasions when I was a graduate student, some of that brown streak you see on the sky on a sunny, sunny day comes from yeah. nitrous oxide. I mean, it's uh, it's just forming naturally from the sunlight. It's uh, um, there, there's a lot of confusion about what's natural and what's man-made and uh, yes. yeah so it's um, uh yeah and it's also a volatile compound so it it reacts with the atmosphere and, and other processes and its lifetime is limited and it's um i remember reading it some papers large. it looks large but it's not as large as people think the night no the uh the, it's like a I think the number is like a thousand times less concentrated than carbon dioxide, right? I mean, it's uh, it's most of the nitrogen compounds are very very small in terms of their numbers. Um, then, of course, you can argue that the absorption line strengths are very strong, but uh, the problem is that the water vapor has already used up all the radiation there anyway, so it doesn't really have much of an impact at all. That's why it didn't work on my model and. You can see that they went through deliberately in that paper to compute uh, the effects from a climate point of view. When I was doing it, I was just saying, well, you know, everyone knew this, that these were really small effects. And um, uh, so I didn't feel that at that time that was something that was a discovery or worth publishing or anything. Nowadays, it needs to be said, but no one wants to hear it so it's hard to publish that because you have two groups there's the one group saying well we already knew this and the other group is saying well you know that can't be wrong that's like some climate denier who's who's writing this i mean it's like no they did these calculations and it has a consequence and maybe it might be a good idea if you didn't uh um uh, increase the price of food so that people starve you know maybe that would be a good idea i mean that's uh yeah, maybe it'd be a good idea not to, um, to intervene and destroy the the, the lives of uh, farmers just because you have this incorrect way of looking at uh, um, the effects of uh, of infrared active gases. So, uh, uh, but they don't want to hear from from uh, uh, voices that say something different than what they hear from these institutions, and that's. That's a serious problem, and uh, it's it's a problem with expertise in general. And it's it wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for the fact that people will automatically become bashful and start saying, "Well, you know, I'm an expert, and uh, so I'll just have to do what they say." And so, but you realize how what an opportunity it is for people who want power because all they have to do is get between you and the experts and say say this is what the experts are saying you know we used to have those um in the in the dark ages you know they they were called shaman you know they speak for the spirits well, they, they tell you what the spirits are saying to you and that's so i tend to think of al gore as kind of a shaman you know that's um, yes right well when you're not when you're not going um when you're not a member of your church anymore and so you're not uh, having a spiritual life that is contained within dogma, like we had with the Judeo-Christian uh, history, you're going to find it somewhere. And so these this this is a bit of a religion, this uh, climate change, right? Because they they have taken what used to be faith in uh, a higher power in God, and they've taken climate, which is also very 
mysterious, right? God is very mysterious. Climate is mysterious too. So I think they oh, yeah. fell, they fell <laughs> into this idea that that this is comparable to that, and uh, <laughs> it's not the same, right? It's not the same. It's not going to take. You oh, to I, I, I quite agree, but they they the extent that there was actually a group that contacted me uh, a few years back and uh, wanted me to participate. They had, they got one of these UN books because there's, there's a, the UN has got so many people involved in this. It's just, you know, yeah, unbelievable, but there's a sort of a, a core group that is actually involved in that actual science of this. And they generate a, you know, like a thousand page report. And then they've got working groups working on different aspects of the problem and on, you know, what kinds of problems that can be caused by it. And these people sit around thinking about, oh, you know, maybe those redheads need to be taken better care of, you know, that kind of thing, you know, it's a, and so they have their own big thick books. And so this group contacted me and they were going around in the local park and uh, they were opening up this great book and then making readings from the book as if it was from the Bible. I mean, it was uh, one of the strangest, weirdest things I'd, I'd, I'd encountered in that respect. What kind uh, of readings? What kind of readings were you? Well, because these things would have uh, long introductory passages about, you know, and I don't know, I'm not going to quote them because I never really looked at those books. They never really interested me because you what could... Were they at the trees or what were they talking about? Uh, well, it's probably you know, what the the impacts are of of all you know inaction and and so forth. And they had this upside down version of, of the precautionary principle, where you're supposed to act if you don't know what's going on, as opposed to not act. I mean, the the, the, the medical version is you're not supposed to act if you don't know what's if you're going to do any harm. Yes. Uh, but but their version is you should act. Uh, if you don't know what's going on, so that's that's, that's, what it's, exactly. that's it's upside down, right? <laughs> the world is upside down, so yes, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot of truth to that, but you know, I I've come to realize after after you know the the whole COVID madness with the truckers and all this other stuff, just how um, unmoored human beings can get. Uh, you know, I mean, my mother was a, was a refugee from World War II, and my father was a combat veteran and so forth. And, and uh, his uncles and, and father and stuff were all in World War I. And, uh, and so, you know, I thought, well, the world was insane then. And now it's, uh, it's, it's, people are going to be reasonable, but no, they just kind of slide over into a different form of of insanity. Yes. Uh, insanity, collective insanity. And I I mean mm -hmm. it it stems from a lot of things. I mean, there's this whole idea of 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 I I kind of distilled it into an acronym. Uh FSL uh stands for fear and self-loathing. So that you have these FSL attacks on you all the time. I mean the 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 climate thing is an FSL attack because you're supposed to feel shame or uh, using a dryer to clean your your sock, dry your socks, uh, and uh, you're supposed to be afraid that the apocalypse is coming. And I can make a list of apocalypses that are far worse than anything you could imagine with climates that are quite possible. And um, I mean, and the, people don't even think about that. And uh, it, the one that's the, the FSL de jour, that's so uh, well. You know, what was COVID was one of them. I mean, there there is such a thing as flu that people die from, and the, they never made an, an, an intelligent, coherent case for why this one was unique compared to other flus. Uh, never would they contextualize it, uh, and and so on. All the th obvious things that you should do so that a uh, coherent understanding could be made of what's going on would just wouldn't happen at any time you try to sort of say, well, what about this? Or what, can you explain that or provide us for evidence? It, you're just basically told to shut up. Right. I mean, yeah. and, no, you know, talk yeah. about vitamin D. Oh no, we can't talk about vitamin D. We can't, we can't talk about uh, zinc. We can't talk about anything. 
We might no, no. talk about meta- metabolic disease. I mean, don't talk about that. Yes. Well, <laughs> which, of course, is one of the major problems in the world. But um, anyway, uh, and, and I still find it hard to talk about that subject because you know, people are still not, you know, they tend to have a kind of reverence to their institutions. And, you know, I mean, the same thing with climate. I mean, the yeah. UN, I mean, that's that's a wonderful institution. So how could they be wrong? Yeah, well, and, it used to be, <laughs> it, it may be, it may have been, but it is no longer that way. And, you know, uh, um, it's very interesting that Sweden didn't have their lockdowns. And in the end, no more people perished there any more than anywhere else. And so... Yeah, I, 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 I'm I skeptical of even their their death numbers. I mean, I think they're... Yeah, I think so, because they attributed yeah. COVID to every death. Every death. If you went in with other chronic diseases, they didn't count that. And so, and you notice that uh, the deaths from regular flu just disappeared. Yeah, that's right. And so if you look at where did how they go? You know, <laughs> there were there was yeah. the same amount of flu yeah. from year to year right through that time. Yeah. And somehow this wasn't a flu, even though at one point coronaviruses were considered to be the only kind of flu there was. Mm-hmm. Of course, there that they don't think that anymore. But at one time, that's what they their, their thinking was. And now this particular coronavirus was singled out and killed people legitimately. but And we're we still see- getting shots for it. I mean, they're still offering shots. You know. Oh, I was, in the, I was in the drugstore the other day and someone was inquiring if he could get a shot mm-hmm. on his own, you know, so the... Um, well, people are, this is the F yeah, and the... Uh, uh, the F, uh, F, S, L, F, fear and self-loathing. I yeah, mean, that's right. it. Yeah, yeah. And you have to, you have to fear, you have to be, you, you have to have this combination of shame and anxiety in order to, to be part of this, this society. So you have to be frightened. And, uh, and so, you know, I would see people with, with uh, one of those uh, N95 masks. And then on top of it, they'd have one of those blue medical masks because, right. well, yeah, twice as safe, right? I mean, that's uh, that's right. I mean, uh, so I, I I got into this conversation with um, a cashier during COVID in in the grocery store because, of course, the grocery stores were open because, well, it wasn't that deadly. I mean, so the, the uh, grocery clerk assured me that uh, uh, WHO was saying that the three layer masks are much more effective, and I explained to her that that actually. Um, um, a plastic bag would be more most effective in this case. <laughs> <laughs> that, w- that would be the only way to be sure, right? I mean, that's uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah my wife, my wife is a, <laughs> yeah, my wife is is uh, or was a nerve. She's retired now, but uh, uh, and she tried to post this article on on uh, on masks. Uh, in which it basically said that really didn't do anything for just general wearing. I mean, it's yes. different if you've got your face in some open wound or something, that's a different issue. But, it, it, you know, it, if you're just generally wearing it, there wasn't a very effective. And she posted it on Facebook and um, they immediately took it down. And right. after that, she just got right out of Facebook. She just said, that's it. I'm done with that. Because you can't even discuss. no basic things and and uh i mean that's the problem with me and and climate is one of the reasons why i sort of stopped pushing the point i think i've kind of said what i needed to say in the book and uh um uh a few more things i could say but you know i mean people's intuitions and trying to help with their people's intuitions about about these things and i think you could i could do that but the problem is where do you find a place to put them. And that was, of course, one of the things that uh, that paper I sent you is on what's called an abstracting service. So that's one of the things that happens in modern science is people will write a paper and prior to sending it to a journal to be reviewed, they'll often put it on one of these servers so that people can access it as an individual uh, beforehand. And in some fields, they're moving so fast that it's very helpful to do that. Yes, and in this and in this case, basically, the author, one of the authors, told me that that it's so difficult to get this thing published mm-hmm. because it doesn't fit into 
you know, I I don't know if you know the old joke that uh, is attributed to Mark Twain is that uh, this uh, review, which is that uh, your paper is uh, both new and interesting. Unfortunately, what's new is not interesting, and what's interesting is not new. So that's uh, so yeah, that that's the kind of problem you have here. Is that well, that's that's totalitarianism, though, right? Well, I think it's more than. I mean, people have this totalitarian impulse, and I think I, you know, see it. I mean, uh, you know, my mother escaped from that, and uh, and so you know, I was because of that. I was an early reader of Solzhenitsyn and so forth. So when I was in, an undergraduate and so on, um, but. Yeah, you because know, she was from Estonia. I don't know if you know. Oh, I've been there. Oh, it's oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, it, it, one day maybe I sh I should tell you the story of my the search for my grandfather's sword. But that that's the topic for another day. I think uh, it what was an you, adventure. I don't yeah, know. it's probably not yeah. that long a story. Well, it's, my father was a colonel in the Estonian army, and the Soviets took him, and uh, and he buried his sword and. Uh, the basement of uh, of the city wall of Tallinn. It's a uh, it's uh, it's one of the buildings there, and uh, so I kind of thought it might be nice to try to see if that could be recovered. And so I was on a this long adventure that went with that, but uh, with the help of some various people, I, I did get into this basement, but it was just covered with fresh concrete at the bottom. So. Uh, uh, but anyway, it was it was quite an adventure. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, but, but the thing is, I I'm familiar with the whole totalitarian thing. My uh, mother's mother, who helped to raise me, um, she had this little aphorism from when I was a child, uh, which I remembered all these years. Uh, at the time, it didn't mean I didn't understand it, but uh, it stuck in my head, and that's that. Uh, the Soviet uh, um, paradise is four families living in one room, each with their private picture of Stalin. So that was <laughs> that was that was that was my my you know childhood understanding of of totalitarianism. So <laughs> so and I I see we we can see that impulse coming out again nowadays. People are just really. Uh, I, I think I saw a video of somebody in the Irish Parliament saying that we have to limit people's freedom uh, all the time, and uh, and so on. And uh, it's amazing how people talk themselves into this. Uh, it's a well, kind that's of where they're trying to cull the cows, right? Two hundred. Well, it, yeah. I mean, it's they're living in a kind of a fantasy world, and and uh, and to some extent, I let people have their fantasies, but. The only reason why I've come forward again, you know, because I'm sick of chasing these nonsense sticks all the time, mm -hmm. uh, is that I think that, that this particular one is going to do some harm. Mm -hmm. And and I'm trying to help, you know, as a kind of public service, because, you know, my those book, the book you read, you know, mm -hmm. this is the second edition. They're mm -hmm. all out of print. I mean, this is like 2007. I mean, it's... Uh, um, uh, I'm not trying to promote anything. I'm trying to help people. And uh, I I could tolerate, you know, um, sanitary napkin machines in the bathroom, but um, it's, it's people just doing what they, but when it comes to people starving because the crop yields have gone down and the price of food is going up. And then I think it's too much. I mean, it's it, it, people have to put the brakes on at the, when the, when that kind of stuff happens. I mean, yeah, well, in Sri Lanka, the, I mean, I don't know if people know, but the collapse of the bountiful agricultural s sector in Sri Lanka as as a result of government restrictions on nitrogen fertilizers because they're worried about nitrous oxide, and like you said, there's no reason <laughs> to be worried about it. No, there people isn't. Are starving because of it. This is yeah, like, and I think they drove the government out of office. I think uh, the government had to run to the hills. And of course, they were trying to be virtuous by doing this, you know. Yeah. Trying to help the world. But there's no point in trying to help the world when you don't really understand how it works. I mean, it's... Uh, I, I think our... our um, uh, Environment minister was making some claims to uh, the COP28 or 
29 or I've lost track of how many there 28. are. 28. Yeah. Right 28, now. 28. Okay. All right. I've lost track of it. Uh, and uh, yeah, see who's making some claim about getting rid of methane. You know, it's like, this is like, what did they think? I mean, it's just, you know, it's, I, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. Because <laughs> it's water vapor mostly, as you said, right at the beginning. It's water Oh, yeah. Wa water is the most, if you want to understand what's going on, you have to understand that. And once you want to try to understand the water vapor, you start to understand that you mustn't be thinking about this from the point of view of temperature. You have to start thinking about it from the point of view of dynamics. So the weather patterns, uh, how water, there's, some, there's a whole cycle of how water gets into the atmosphere, how it comes out. That's a really complex thing because it's not just... Now, if you're soaks and fluid dynamics, it's also thermodynamics at the same time of phase changes and so forth happening simultaneously. And uh, that is a really tough problem uh, uh, scientifically. And uh, meteorologists have been on that for a long time and have been trying to get a grasp of it. But um, what I think is going to happen ultimately is that we're going to uh, see different versions of this re climate regime that we're in. And what will happen is the, the thing that is most important is that you have these, um, in the oceans, you have these slow dynamics that are going on that have uh, many decades worth, and they kind of interact with each other over long distances and uh, uh, because they happen slowly and they change weather patterns. And you can have changes in weather patterns that are consistent and persistent that will cause droughts in some places and, and floods in others and over a decades. Or, mm -hmm. And then if they interact in different ways, then you can get something called multi-periodicity, which is not quite chaos, but it has that effect because you never get, you don't get this periodic return to things. You get this kind of, a slow approach to something and then it kind of goes a whoop part again and that's uh um there's there's something called mid mathematics called recurrence so you can have recurrent dynamics as opposed to periodic dynamics so you just kind of get close to the where you were but then it goes off and does something a little different than it did last time and uh, and so you can get these kind of low dimensional kinds of things in the ocean modes so there's there are ocean modes in, in the Atlantic and in the Pacific. And of course, the one we're having this year is El Nino, but there's also an oscillation in the North Pacific, and there's another one in the Atlantic, North Atlantic overturning. And uh, these things are, um, may, they ensure that the weather is going to change its patterns over the course of many, many years. So you get certain kinds of weather patterns for a few years and then another type of weather pattern for another years, other years. And none of that has to have anything to do with averages of temperature. So the CO2 could drive these things in ways that people don't are only sort of barely aware of. And uh, I mean, you can see the, the way the weathers are, weather is tracking this year versus previous years. You can see there's this kind of oscillation of, of uh, of cold and warm air, and uh, it's causing the the uh, us to swing between warm and cold and warm and cold on the, on the on the main North American continent. And uh, um, whereas in some years you'll get a situation where the the pattern is just more or less uniform, and you know, uh, so we're that's mainly because of El Nino. And uh, when I was at the Canadian Climate Center. That was something they were just coming to be aware of. That if they took the, the, they hiked up the surface temperatures on the in the Pacific, that it would affect the weather in eastern Canada. I mean, that would that's that's in fact what would happen. And and so they they kind of thought you know there's something bigger going on here than just you know whether someone is using too much carbon dioxide. Uh, or producing carbon dioxide or or nitrogen uh, uh, um, nitrous oxide. There is a bunch of oxides of nitrogen, so is why I was stumbling there. Um, anyway, no, so that's, that's totally that's not what I'm. Uh, I, I, my research is to try to escape from this stuff, but I, it's like you know, once you're 
you're in they pull you back in you know think you're out you know and they pull you back in stuff. <laughs> i don't know i think uh i really learned a lot from your book and uh, this paper that you sent me i think was really helpful um and we know that you know these government officials are offering false solutions for false emergencies for false moral posturing so we we know that there's a a disconnect between scientific knowledge and the bureaucrats and what they are pushing because they are looking for false moral posturing and i mean who knows you know you said i think these are kind of universal problems though i mean i think that more than one person has told me over the years that when you make a career uh like what i've been doing you have to make some kind of choice early on about how you're going to proceed either you're going to identify what the society is really rewarding people for or you go off on your own rugged road on what you think is important and uh um i think that both of them have their advantages i mean I, you'll get all kinds of awards and recognition going one way and if you go the other way you're going to discover some really cool stuff and um and uh, have a lot of very interesting experiences but you're going to be constantly at loggerheads with the uh, other the other path and um I, I had that experience uh when i was at um i was uh, on ensor council and uh uh, the president of the Royal Society was at a gathering and we got talking and, and he said, oh, you look like, a you know, someone who might be good to be a member of the Royal Society of Canada. And I said, ah, oh, you would never have me. He says, why is that? Then I started explaining my views on climate. They said, you're right. You know, so, 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 you know, you could see that, you know. I, I wouldn't, you know, it was it uh, Groucho Marx say that remark about uh, I wouldn't want to belong to any organization which would have me as a member. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know if I'd want to belong to that. <laughs> so, anyway. Well, so, I don't know if you're interested, but uh, Peterson Academy is always looking for professors to give um, lectures on what they are passionate about because we're trying to educate people on, you know, real science, real literature, real religion, real English real history without ideological slants to anything. So if you're interested in any of that, mm -hmm. I can always put you in touch with uh, my daughter who is running the. If, if you see some place where I can make a contribution yep, I to think the, where, where, the world in a positive way, I'm okay with that. I, I, I don't like wasting my time barking into the wind, which is right. like a lot of my career has been on this subject. I mean, on other subjects, I've made some real successes, but on this subject, it's kind of, it's been kind of hopeless in a lot of ways. So I try to stick to my own knitting for the most part, but yeah, I mean, if, if I, if I have an audience where people can, uh, I can explain some stuff. Yeah. Then yeah, sure. I, I like explaining. It would, explaining it would be in front of a live audience too, when you were like, okay. so, it, so it's not a, it's not a virtual kind of thing. So. Yeah, I think that I think that would be good. Okay, yeah. well, let let me know. I, I, okay, I'll I will. See. I will. Um, Thank you very much. Do you have anything further you want to say? <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I think I should just keep my mouth shut. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's very I, easy. I, I could do. I could get into some sort of new new rant. I mean, I, I think I've already gored a bunch of oxes here already. So. Uh, yeah. I think I could probably talk to you again. You're a very, very interesting fellow. You know so much about uh, physics, and uh, I know nothing. And so I could always learn more. And uh, Yes, we all can always learn more. That's yeah, the whole true. point. Yeah, that's, that's, true. The whole, that's Yeah, true. that's the whole point. And that's why we're citizens. And I, I like the yeah. responsible citizen thing, is that yeah. over time, the media should be educating people as opposed to putting the same misconceptions in right. all the time. And we should, 10 years down the road, we shouldn't be 
contending with the same misunderstandings that we talked about 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and 30 years ago. And the public understanding of these things hasn't changed in 40 years. And it's the, the news media keeps presenting the same thing things incorrectly. And but I think the society could function better if we could get people get experts a little bit cautious about talking to people because they know stuff. I mean, that's uh, that's what I'd like to see. And then, then you know, people are a lot smarter than they're given credit for. And, and if they're given a chance, they can uh, really surprise you. And uh, so that's something I really believe in. Sounds like a plan.